So we have the second part of this morning session with, uh, uh, at least for the second time, a very famous economist who has a famous relative. Or, well, I didn't refer to that for the f maybe the second speaker too, but I don't know of that. Um, and he will talk of uh, something which I thought was a joke, but I checked with the, old, the, the speaker and it's not a joke. Um, Parisian geometers and equilibrium. Good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, first thing I need to say is that um, <clears throat> most of this talk is based on joint work with Elizabeth Baldwin, who is an absolutely wonderful co-author. And secondly, thank you Paris School for inviting me to here today, because it is a very, very special pleasure, because when I was young, the thing that I most enjoyed was geometry and in particular geometry that was largely developed here in Paris. So, this is a picture I drew when I was 15 or 16, and I wonder how many of you know whose beautiful theorem this picture represents. <laughs> All the Parisians here. Okay, well, this was Brionchon's theorem, Charles Julien Brionchon, uh, and he was a professor at the artillery school, which is just a few miles down the road, I think. Another picture I drew when I was uh, 15. Whose theorem is this? This is Pascal's theorem. You all know who Pascal is, I hope. Uh, and uh, he was in and out of Paris a lot, so I think we can, he qualifies as a uh, Parisian geometer. Uh, so what do these theorems say? Let me do Pascal's theorem uh, first. Pascal's theorem tells me that if I take any conic and take any six points around that conic and label those six points in any order that you choose, I've labeled them A, B, C, A prime, B prime, C primed, and then do uh, the following construction. I first of all take the line A, B primed and the line B, A primed and see where those two lines join. They join at the point C double primed. And then, of course, I take the lines um, B, C primed and B primed C, and I take the lines C, A primed and C primed A, and I construct three points that way, and those three points are collinear. Sorry? Good it's a wonderful theorem. <laughs> and, um, of course, there are 60 essentially different ways of ordering those points. So there are 60 Pascal lines that uh, we have there. So why do I love these theorems so much? Uh, well, apart from the fact that they're just a beautiful theorem. Two reasons. First of all, they illustrate duality. Cross out the word point and write line cross out the word po line and write point everywhere, and I have another theorem, which is Brionchon's. So what I've done, I've just illustrated that. So rather than six points around the conic, I take six lines that are tangent to the conic, and take, rather than taking pairs of points to construct lines, I take pairs of lines. So I begin by taking uh, A primed B and A B primed. Those two pairs of lines give me two points. I therefore can construct three lines that way. And whereas over here I had three points that were collinear, here I have three lines that go through a single point, the Brionchon point. Okay, so first of all, this um, illustrates uh, duality. Um, secondly, um, the nature of the proof um, is rather beautiful as well. So let me talk about that. There are actually multiple ways of proving this. I could show you um, at least three. Uh, but the way in which we will do it is we'll use Bezu's theorem. Because Bezu was another Parisian geometer. He also worked in the artillery school, same artillery school, uh, a little bit earlier. Um, and so we'll use his approach. The, Probably the approach that, well, the approach I used when I was 15 or 16 would have been Des, via Desargues, but Desargues, I think, was Lyonnais, so we'll leave him aside um, for today and stick with uh, Bezu. 
And Bayeux's theorem is also uh, beautifully efficient. So what does Bayeux's theorem say? Bayeux understood, well actually you all understand, that if we take two lines, they intersect in a single point. Unless they meet infinity, in which case they intersect at a point infinity. <coughs> Unless they're actually coincident, in which case they intersect lots of points. If you take a line and, for example, a parabola, or indeed an ellipse, a quadratic form, they intersect twice, exactly twice, unless, well, there may, of course, be um, no intersections in the real plane because we have complex roots. If you solve your quadratic, it may have complex roots. Or there may be a tangency, which would be two intersections at the same place. But provided you know how to count, a line and a quadratic form intersect exactly twice. And so Bayeux's theorem is that the number of intersections of two polynomials is the product of their degrees, except in the kinds of special cases that I've just been talking about. So, um, Bayeux's theorem actually allows me to prove this result very fast. So I think this will be the hardest math I do today, but it's actually going to be very simple, so sorry, I, I didn't mean to make you all uh, stop listening. Um, how do I prove this? Well, that's the whole proof, so it's not going to be too hard. Um, take the three lines that I've drawn in red. Three lines are a cubic form. Obviously, a line is of degree one. The product of two lines is a quadratic. The product of three lines is a cubic. So the three lines in red together are a degenerate cubic. Similarly, the three lines I've marked in blue are another cubic. Both those two cubics have been chosen to go through all the points A, B, C, A prime, B prime, C prime, A double prime, B double prime, C double primed. If, all the, if both cubics go through all the nine points I've mentioned, then any um, linear combination of those cubics also go through all nine points. And I can choose the appropriate linear combination to go through any tenth point in the plane. So let me choose the appropriate linear combination also go through some arbitrary point x that I marked on the conic. And now we use uh, the magic theorem the magic Parisian theorem of Bayeux. Um, we have a conic, the original ellipse I drew, and we have a cubic, the linear combination of the two sets of lines, and they meet in seven points, A, B, C, A prime, B prime, C prime, and X, which is too many. That's seven points. So if those two things meet in seven points, it must be the special case in which the cubic form actually contains the conic, just like when two lines meet in too many points, they're on top of each other. So the cubic form must be the conic plus a line, which has to be a prime, a double prime, b double prime, c double prime. So that is a sufficient proof for Pascal's uh, lovely theorem. So why do we begin with that? I mean, the first thing is. Um, <coughs> I want to take away just how powerful that intersection theorem is, just how quickly we get that result. But you're probably saying it to yourself now, all this stuff about ellipses, we don't really use ellipses much in economics. So why am I talking about this? Is this all some kind of joke, as uh, <laughs> Philippe suggested? No, because one of the beauties of intersection theorems is that, of course, if you transform objects, then intersection properties remain. What intersects with what will still be true after any transformation. And in economics, of course, we do a lot with intersections of different things. And I'm going to show you that I can transform cubics and conics and linear forms, work with those intersections, and tell us a lot about equilibrium. And a lot more, actually. And the other thing you might ask at this point, since I sort of wax so enthusiastically, is why didn't I become an academic geometer? Since it was such lovely stuff. And I'm afraid the answer to that is that although I was obsessed by this stuff at age 15 and 16, I then discovered that Pascal discovered and proved the theorem when he was 16. <laughs> so I figured that probably I should leave geometry to the French and go and do something easier, like economics. 
which is why I'm here today. So, here then is the plan of action. I am going to show you that the transformations of polynomials do indeed represent consumer choice. So we can use Bayes' theorem and other wonderful things. The geometry then gives us all kinds of new results about preferences, including about when Walrasian equilibrium uh, exists. In particular, we're going to get new results for when competitive equilibrium exists for indivisible objects. There's lots known about when competitive equilibrium exists for divisible objects, but I want to talk about uh, indivisible and equilibrium there. So I actually wondered, and you might be wondering whether I'm going to claim Leon um, Vaura as a Parisian geometer. He was educated in Paris. I don't think he's really a geometer, though. So I'm not going to include him uh, in my list. Also, I'm actually more fond of the Parisian geometers I've talked about because they were more practical men. I mean, Pascal famously did all kinds of practical stuff. Uh, Brianchon was an officer uh, in the army in the Napoleonic Wars, so I'm sure he was using his geometry to probably work out the right angle to point guns to kill off Englishmen faster and more of them. Uh, so important stuff like that. And so what I want to show you and emphasize is that this is actually very practical. Uh, I'm going to show you how to use this in practice, in particular to develop auctions. Um, and so I am going to show you um, how we can use this to uh, develop nice, simple auctions that people actually use in practice, are using in practice. Um, most auction research today is, uh, uses game theory as its starting point. It focuses a lot on strategic interaction, it focuses a lot on information issues. Uh, these things are important, but they're not always the critical issues. Uh, I think we'll raise in equilibrium, competitive equilibrium, it's a much simpler assumption than Nash equilibrium, and we can use it, therefore, to focus on developing uh, simple, efficient auctions, um, especially when there are a reasonable number of bidders, it can be a very good starting point. Uh, and even more broadly, it can be a good starting point for developing um, practical auctions. We want to do robustness checks if they're just a tiny number of bidders. But this is the philosophy that I am using in practice now, that by starting thinking about well, raising equilibrium, uh, we can develop things that are working well. And I, you know, I've, these, these auctions are being used. Uh, I've talked to governments in um, several countries. I'm actually talking, if I'm overdressed, it's because I'm actually talking to French government officials this afternoon. Um, so I think this is actually uh, important stuff. So in particular, we can, if we can represent consumer choice, we can represent bidders' preferences. We can develop geometric bidding language for auctions. And since I want to run auctions that find wall raise in equilibrium, it's very helpful to know when wall raise in equilibrium actually exists, because that will give me some kind of limit on uh, what I can do effectively. So, to begin, Transform polynomials will represent consumer choice. So, I would like a piece of fruit for lunch. Uh, either an apple or a banana, not both. I value an apple at uh, 60 cents, a banana at 50 cents. So this is a map of my preferences. This is a map of what I want as a function of the prices of apples and bananas that you will be charging at lunch. Uh, if prices are really high, then I will go without. If prices are high on apples but low on bananas, I will choose a banana. Conversely, um, with high prices on bananas, I will choose an apple. And with quasi-linear preferences, we'll have a 45-degree line separating these two regions, uh, showing me where one choice is better than the other choice. So... Um, let me make, first of all, a trivial transformation uh, of negative prices to plus x, because I'd rather deal with uh, plus to begin with. And then let me make a rather uh, more surprising transformation, perhaps, which is I'm going to transform addition into multiplication and maximization into addition. 
and if you accept such a transformation, I have the equation of a line. Okay? Let's take a slightly more complicated problem. Now I want to buy a piece of fruit, not just for myself, um, but for my friend uh, Philippe here. And Philippe, um, he has got even stronger preferences for apples over bananas. Uh, so this line, as I'm going to be calling it, represents his preferences. And so the aggregate value of the two of us is simply the sum of these two maximizations. And so if I now do my tra same transformation, um, addition to multiplication, maximization to addition, you can see that I now have two lines. And um, because we have, I'm summing my passive utilities, I've now got a quadratic form, the product of the two lines. And that actually is a legitimate uh, transformation. Um, that may be surprising to uh, many of you. Um, I will show you what the transformation is. I'm not going to go through a detailed explanation uh, since it's uh, rather deep mathematics. Um, but if we start with a point in the complex plane, so this is a point in two-dimensional complex space, and first of all take the log of the absolute values, and then like, take the limit of um, the logs to uh, the base of the log to zero, uh, I get a family of curves, and that gives me the tropical line. Uh, this is for a particular example. This is for a line in the complex space. So the line in complex space goes to the tropical line in real space. If I have a quadratic form in complex space, uh, the two steps go first to here and secondly to here, which you see looks a bit like the kind of quadratic form I showed you earlier. Uh, so... Um, what we have is that a valuation over n goods corresponds to a polynomial in n variables represented by a tropical hypersurface. Um, so in two dimensions, I divide up price space by one-dimensional lines into two-dimensional areas, which say where I'm going to choose different bundles of objects. In n dimensions, we will have um, <clears throat> n minus 1 dimensional tropical hypersurfaces that divide up my n dimensional space into regions where I buy different n dimensional bundles. OK. And um, we can use the mathematics literature to quite quickly show the following result, which I've called a valuation polyhedral complex equivalence theorem, because pictures like this one are polyhedral, they're sets of polyhedral pieces, so they form co polyhedral complexes. And the point, therefore, is that I can look at geometric objects like these, work with objects like these, and understand them as economic valuations, subject to a fairly simple condition I know that a picture of pieces like this that I draw will represent a legitimate quasi-linear utility function. And so I can develop theorems and results and intuitions simply with pictures and know that they will apply to actual valuations and vice versa. So it's actually a very powerful tool. Um, and because it is just a transformation from complex space into real space, things like Bayes' theorem are going to hold. Properties about numbers intersections will apply. Uh, and so we need to extend it to take account of the details of the transformation. And so I don't actually know where Benstein, Bertrand, and Behan, I don't know whether they have a Parisian education or not. I can tell you that Bertrand and Behan are certainly a francophone. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know whether they qualify in our list of Parisians or not. But um, in any case, we can use Bayes' theorem uh, in our context. In fact, Bayes' theorem actually works better now than it did before. 
because previously, Bayes' theorem, um, you had to worry about the fact that the intersections may be um, in complex space, so not in the real plane. But because I've started in the complex space and <laughs> taken transformation to the real space, we can always now see the intersections in real space. So it actually works better than before. For example, here's a tropical line, as before. Here is a tropical quad, uh, cubic. I don't expect you to know that's a cubic at this point, but that is a cubic form, uh, a tropical cubic form. Um, and if I intersect, if I superimpose my line and my cubic, they must intersect exactly three times. One, two, three. If I move my line around, they will in still intersect three times, because one times three equals three. You'll see that this time they intersect on three different arms of my line, but it's still always, however you move that line around, it will intersect exactly three times. And that is Bayes' theorem working better in uh, this geometry. So that's all great. Let me show you a different tropical cubic and the same line. And now it intersects exactly twice. So what's gone wrong here? What's gone wrong here is that we have a tangency. Um, so something funny has happened. Uh, it's reflected by the tangency. And in fact, if we have a situation like that with a tangency, that is going to correspond precisely to competitive equilibrium not existing, the failure of an intersection. I'll show you why in a bit. Uh, and moreover, in my original example I showed you, the reason that structures like these intersect precisely three times is it precisely the same mathematical equivalent to the fact that competitive equilibrium will always exist if people have valuations of this general form. So, we will demonstrate that in a little bit. Let me go back, first of all, to uh, our simple picture of someone who wants up to two pieces of fruit. And my point is that I can, people can express their preferences quite simply all we need to know to express the preferences here fully are the positions of the two red dots. So, this can be used as a bidding language. The consumer can express his preferences by expressing those two red dots. So, a bid in one of my auctions will be a list of price vectors, a list of any length of price vectors, and associated quantities. So, in this case, you want one piece of fruit up to 50 for uh, banana or up to 60 for the apple, another piece of fruit where you pair to pay up to 90 uh, cents for the apple and 25 cents for the banana. So the bidding language will simply be reflected by this list of um, vectors and easily representable in uh, price space in this way. So then the question becomes, how rich is this language? How much of people, what kind of preferences can be expressed this way? Right. Can the consumer express any quasi-linear preferences by a language like this? Now, there are clearly going to have to be some sorts of restrictions. So, for example, if you only have one-to-one -one trade offs between goods, can we express everything by a set of dot bids like this? Any legitimate any quasi-linear preferences at all? And the answer expressed as simply to that question, actually, is no. Not even one-to-one -one trade offs between goods. However, if we think about this, um, so here is an example of a set of preferences, an entirely reasonable set of preferences, one-to-one -one trade offs everywhere. There's always a switch and you're adding an apple or adding a banana or subtracting one of them or moving from one more banana to and one less apple at the same time. Always one-to-one -one trade offs. I cannot express that with these kinds of lines because of um, this point here where these three meet. What I can do, however, I can get close. So I can draw this tropical line 
and begin to build up my picture, if I draw another tropical line and a third tropical line, and I've now drawn a cubic, because the product of three lines is a tropical cubic, and you now see I've got most of what I want, but there's that bit in the middle, but if I now subtract that tropical line in the middle, I have got exactly what I want. So a tropical cubic divided by a tropical line corresponds in ordinary geometry, I mean plus corresponds to multiplication, uh, division will correspond to minus. So if I subtract the tropical line, I do actually get exactly what I want. So, I mean these are the preferences that reflect um, the, the preferences I wanted to um, represent. And so tropical factorization like this can represent any preferences with one-to-one -one trade offs if I allow myself negative dot bids, negative lines, as well as positive ones. So, theorem any bidder with one to one trade offs everywhere can perfectly represent its preferences using positive and negative uh, dot bids. Uh, some of you will n know that, or guess actually, probably not know, that one to one trade offs everywhere correspond to strong substitutes preferences, which some people have studied. Um, I'm not sure whether it's actually in the literature that, that strong substitutes is one-to-one -one trade offs but it comes out very easily from working with this geometry, and other results come out very easily from working with this geometry. Um, but the question you might be asking now is, well, this still is a rather restrictive set of preferences, um, and the answer to that is to generalize our bidding language further, or to generalize the, language, the way in which we're representing preferences further. So if I generalize my so-called dot bids to allow people to say how much I want at any point, where it isn't just one apple or one banana, but maybe two apples or one banana, this is a two-to-one trade-off. This, therefore, will create a tropical hypersurface, uh, divide up the plane according to my preferences what I want to buy where, that looks more like that. Well, in this case, it looks exactly like that. And uh, so... Our result is that any bidder with any substitutes preferences can perfectly represent its preferences using generalized positive and negative <coughs> dot bids. So what I'm showing you is how I can build up a language that represents preferences. Um, you may just be interested in this because it's a nice way of characterizing different kinds of preferences and we can actually work with this, this characterization to get new results uh, about preference functions. Uh, I'm most interested because I want people to be able to represent their preferences in auctions like this. So I'm going to run auctions, I do run auctions in which bidders make dot bids, and auctioneer then chooses a competitive equilibrium. And therefore, as we've discussed, I need to know whether competitive equilibrium exists. So we'll go back now to this problem, that competitive equilibrium may not always exist with uh, preferences like that because there were too few intersections and I'm going to discuss why that's happening and when it won't happen. So here is a very simple example of a failure of equilibrium. So I've got one consumer called uh, C because he's actually a compliments consumer. He wants either an apple or and a banana or nothing and another one who wants an apple or a banana but never both. As always, I can aggregate demand, work out total demand by superimposing the individual demands, and that is over here. And I can now count the intersections between my tropical hypersurfaces, and there's only one intersection. And one intersection turns out to be too few. Um, if the Parisian geometers in the audience, they might think that, they might wonder why um, the correct number of intersections here is two. The answer is I've only shown you the uh, tropical forms in positive space, and if you draw them out into negative space, it'll become more obvious that what I've got is a conic and a line, and therefore I should have two intersections. I only have one, and therefore equilibrium fails. There is no equilibrium if there's just one apple and one banana for sale. There are no prices at which demand is one apple and one banana. It's clear the only possible place is here, that's by looking at the picture. And the trouble is, um, the one guy wants one or the other, and the other guy wants both or none, and so we can't just be selling two pieces of fruit. 
So in this case, it's straightforward. We, the simple argument tells us, but more generally, we can do it by counting intersections or indeed by other methods that we will come to. So that shows you why equilibrium is failing there. And what I mean by failure of equilibrium, there are no prices at which both an apple and a banana would be bought, and there is neither excess supply or excess demand. Here's another example. Uh, again, it's actually a conic and a line. Uh, so the correct number in sections is two. The correct number is met. Here, well, however many pieces of fruit there are, there are always a set of points at which um, the right number of pieces of fruit is demanded, neither excess supply nor excess demand. Okay, so now I promise to show you uh, why this is working. Or rather, in the top case, not working. And so we talked about intersection theorem. I told you the other th thing that was beautiful about theorems I began with was duality. Duality is the key to understanding this. So I showed you how to represent preferences in price space. That was this picture I keep coming back to. But I could equally represent the same preference in quantity space. The value of an apple is 60. The value of a banana is 50 because I never want both, the value of having both actually is just 60. I'll just throw away the piece of fruit I like less. So the same preferences are represented in quantity space or in price space in these two different ways. And so here is the example where equilibrium failed. And I've shown you there the representation in quantity space of the aggregate demand in price space. And in quantity space, it's helpful perhaps at this point, I mean, this, these numbers in the circles are the utilities, the aggregate utilities. So let's draw that in a third dimension and show then the height in the third dimension is the utility of the individual bundles. And what you see now is why equilibrium is failing. And that is that this middle bundle here, A plus B, an apple and a banana, is below the top of this, it's below the surface of this function. If I take the least concave function that goes on top of this uh, picture, then A plus B is below it. You can see that um, choosing this point is worse than the average of these four points, so it's strictly below it. Um, and what we're doing here is what you're used to in ordinary, with ordinary divisible goods, uh, looking at supporting hyperplanes. Because this point is strictly below the um, surface, there is no hyperplane that touches this point. There is no price vector such that this can be an optimum. It's the usual kind of argument. So this cannot be an optimum. We now project down back into two dimensions. So take the roof and project it down to the floor in the way I've shown you. And now we begin to see the duality between the pictures in price space and quantity space. Uh, because any area in, price, in quantity space has a corresponding point in price space. So I've done them color to color. So for example, this red area, um, which um, is the one that's marked out as being the triangle with uh, corners A, 0, and B, corresponds to this red point, which separates the areas a, 0, and B. And correspondingly, any area here, any two-dimensional um, piece here, corresponds to a zero-dimensional piece here. And if I take a one-dimensional line in one space, there's a one-dimensional piece orthogonal to it in the other space. So the general principle is, and this applies in any number of dimensions, a k-dimensional object in one space is orthogonal to the n minus k-dimensional object of the same color in the quantity space, or at least the same color in this picture. Why is that? Well, it's actually quite easy to see that in two dimensions. Go back to a picture like my usual one. Um, this set of prices here marks out the points at which I'm indifferent between bundle x and bundle y. Because as I cross the red set of prices, I move between these two bundles. So if I'm indifferent between x and y along these points, then these are the prices at which my utility from x minus the price of the bundle x is my utility from y minus the price of bundle y. In other words, rearranging that equation, the price vector is orthogonal to the vector x minus y. 
So the demand change is orthogonal to the set of prices. And that is what is being illustrated there. <coughs> that um, here there is a demand change from A to B, and it's orthogonal to the set of prices where I'm indifferent between A and B. And that will apply uh, quite generally in uh, multiple dimensions. And so now we can see uh, the theorem I've been quoting. Remember our isolated dot, um, A plus B, apple plus banana, is the one that was never chosen. And the fact there's an isolated dot there is, of course, the same fact, essentially, that the pink area is very large. And so the point is, is if there's a very large area on the right, that must mean there are fewer areas in total on the right, and that means by duality there are fewer points on the left. And Bayes' theorem tells how many points there ought to be. So, theorem, failure of equilibrium is too large a region in quantity space, which means too few regions, so too few points in price space. Equilibrium will exist if we have the right number of intersections, and the magic Parisian theorem tells us the right number of intersections. And actually, we can say more looking here, because the problem here is this large area in quantity space. And a large area in quantity space, well, how do I know there's going to be a large area? How can I measure areas? You may remember, I know Parisians learn lots of mathematics, that the area is the dot product of the two vectors of the edges, um, if it's a parallelogram. So the two vectors of the edges multiplied give us the area. And so, if the, and in that again will generalize to many dimensions, so if the vectors that make up our pictures are the right kind, then however we multiply them together, the areas are not going to be very large, and equilibrium will exist. So in particular, equilibrium will exist for every amount of goods that there might be if for every subset of n vectors where n is the number of goods um, the determinant of those vectors is 0 or uh, 1 in absolute value. So uh, we can go back to our original diagram uh, with failure of equilibrium and we can understand it either by counting intersections 1 is less than 1 times 2 or by looking at the vectors that separate the regions in price space and taking determinants of pairs of vectors. Um, and the determinant of pairs of vectors, and I said the pairs of vectors are actually orthogonal to the lines I've drawn in price space, uh, has absolute value, which is too much here, and therefore that tells us there can be failure of equilibrium. Uh, with this pair of consumers, however, the, pair, the vectors that... Um, show uh, people's choices in price space are all of those six possible vectors and any pair of vectors you choose from that um, their determinant will either be zero or one and so equilibrium must exist in that case. So the obvious comment then is that these vectors are really important and so we're going to classify, we can classify demands, preferences according to the vectors that um, they induce. Um, so in fact, any strong substitutes demand system has to have vectors of just these three types and the opposite one. Um, it's the three ones I've drawn. You're either always um, going to one less banana or to one less apple or the opposite or you're switching an apple and a banana. And those are the only possible changes you can make. Of course, where these lines may be, where the lines are, can, they can be anywhere in price space. But they can only be of that, in those directions. Here's an even simpler example. Um, I mean, a, a joke example, if you like. Uh, you're interested in car bodies and wheels, so obviously you want them in the ratio 1 to 4. How many you want will depend upon the prices. But whatever the price is um, and your utility function, but the divisions in price space will always be that you go as prices rise from 16 wheels and 4 car bodies to 12 wheels and 3 car bodies, etc. So the divisions in price space can be anywhere, but they must always be of the same slope. So this is a demand type um, is reflected by a single slope. 
The reason why I started drawing these pictures was because when I was working with the Bank of England at the beginning of the financial crisis, and they asked me to design an auction, um, I saw that bidders' preferences were going to be of this form, that they were always going to be, they wanted, they were getting loans from the Bank of England, and we just had a first bank run for 140 years. We had to get money out to the uh, bank that needed them, and there's a question of how much different banks should pay. But it's always going to be that a bank, I want a loan of a given size, and it would, you know, it would either give good collateral or bad collateral, but it wasn't going to say, I want 100 million if it's this collateral, or 200 if it's, bad, that, if it's bad collateral. It was going to be 100 million, and you know, I'll give good collateral or bad collateral depending on the interest rates. Um, so the kinds of preferences that people had were naturally of this form. And so these pictures describe those preferences, and this is therefore what I worked with. Okay, so um, I'm running out of time, so let me just tell you that lots of things we can do by classifying demand types this way. First of all, you see that very few vectors summarize as demand types. I showed you strong substitutes, I showed you ordinary substitutes, I can do complements, I can do lots of things. They summarize the key properties and comparative statics of demand. I've shown you new theorems about equilibrium. Um, I can use the same results to get theorems about matching because matching is like people complements preferences and well a stable match is like equilibrium uh, but I'm not going to, to talk about any of those things I'm going to have to move straight on to auctions so briefly in my last few minutes um, the auction I wrote for the Bank of England it still used regularly to support financial stability um, they run it more or less often depending upon how stressed things are so after the Brexit vote they ran it weekly uh, at the moment, they're running it monthly, but we had a, this bad election last week, so we'll see what happens next. Uh, the way it works is quite simple. All bidders state their preferences, and we then implement competitive equilibrium given bidders' stated preferences. The auctioneer can do what it wants. It needn't tell the truth. In fact, the Bank of England does. And if there are sufficiently many bidders, of course, then they do best to tell the truth, because if you're a small bidder or you're small relative to the auction, you don't think you're going to affect the prices and the auction is going to give you what's best for you given the final prices, so you may as well simply tell the truth. Provided the bidding language is sufficiently expressive, and I've shown you that, uh, told you that it is, and also sufficiently easy that everyone can understand. It's really important that they actually understand it well. Um, the auction can still work well with a small number of bidders, but uh, not much time for that now. So geometry illustrates and explains the auction. It shows what can be exactly represented by our auction and by what versions of our language and tells us you know, what kinds of restrictions on bids we might have to make uh, that we can run auctions like this. What's critical is it's easy for people to understand and use. I had to persuade the governor of the Bank of England that you know, in a few, the minute, few minutes he gave me that this was actually going to work, and that he understood what was happening and why it was working, and why it would be the right thing. And it's also, of course, critical that bidders are comfortable doing this. So I've shown you how to make dot bids. I've shown you that aggregating it is straightforward from the auctioneer's point of view. It doesn't matter which bidders, bids come from which bidders. Aggregate demand is the same. So this is the example of all the bids of all the bidders. And you can simply say how, you know, not just you want a bid um, at a given pair of prices, but also uh, how many pieces you want at a price vector. And what's important also is that I've shown you a particular way of representing these preferences. But we can also aggregate these preferences and work with these preferences and draw pictures that are much more natural for real-world people, like central bankers or other bankers. Uh, I can show you, for example, in two dimensions, how to uh, take the set of bids that I think I just had here and construct what I call a relative demand curve as a function of the difference between the prices that you charge for the two goods, I'm just in two dimensions for the moment, how much will be demanded of um, good A relative to good B. So in fact, if you went into the Bank of England on a Tuesday in the middle of the month, at about 10.30, um, in the early years of the financial crisis, on their screens you would see a picture like this being formed. You would see a supply function which showed the bank's preferences, what the bank wanted to do. It's more complicated than that. They don't want me to show what they actually look like. And as the bids came in, you'd see the relative demand function being formed. And then the outcome of the auction is the competitive equilibrium. This is all we're doing. Pictures like this determined the auction solution. And, you know, this was... Well, they like this a lot because these guys, they're 
quite good economists. They've learned economics as undergraduates or graduate students. They understand competitive equilibrium as a lovely thing, has lots of nice properties. Um, and so this made Mervyn King very happy indeed. Um, I think he really was uh, very happy. Um, <clears throat> he could see from his, on his screen how as when things became more stressed, that pushed out the relative demand curve and moved to, to a new equilibrium where the price difference between good collateral and bad collateral was higher. So he could see on this picture in a very natural way how more stress conditions led to uh, having to give out more loans against bad collateral but equally higher prices for uh, bad collateral. So it changed him from looking something like that to something like that. I hope he doesn't mind me showing um, those pictures. As I think he really was happy. Uh, I believe that at the Christmas lunch that year, he um, told all the staff how wonderful it was that uh, you know, auctions could actually implement competitive equilibrium and all the beautiful results that that uh, led to. I said that with a screenshot from the Bank of England. Uh, that's in the early years. Of course, now they that's for just two goods. Uh, now they do it for more goods. So we have more complicated pictures than that. The important thing is to get people started simple. Once they understand how it works in a simple case, they can uh, go further. So uh, we start with the um, simple language. We generalized it uh, to a richer language. Um, the most recent update to the Bank of England's auction allows some complements preferences uh, for the central bank itself. Uh, we can have other dialects of our language. So the Icelandic government came to me and said, is there a way in which you can, we can use your kind of auction in a context where bidders essentially have fixed budgets without going into the details of the problem? Um, we'll have a fixed budget. So a bid now, I said, would be an, an amount of money to be spent entirely on whatever good is best value for you. So a bid now here is an amount of money to be spent either on all, apple, all on apples or all on bananas. So this is the number of apples or bananas you'd buy as a function of the prices. So the pictures are a bit different. All these lines now go through the origin. A bit different from before. But again, we can have people making multiple bids. And again, we can aggregate the bids in just the same way as before. Uh, so um, we can do similar kinds of things. Uh, so I've come basically to the end. So here we have the advert. Um, Mervyn King saying nice things, but perhaps the acid test is that when Mark Carney replaced him, he said he would like to have you know, uh, extend, me to extend this work. Uh, and so with Elizabeth's help, I extended it to uh, more varieties and endogenous supply. And uh, it continues to make the Bank of England uh, very happy. Uh, there are lots of things I haven't had time to talk about. I haven't had, to had time to talk about solving the auction, of course. Um, again, what was important was that in simple cases, I could show very easily how to solve it. I could give the principles to the um, governor in a few minutes. I went in detail with each deputy governor, and it took about half an hour to an hour. And so that meant they felt they understood it, and I could do it through a graphical mechanism, and that was really important. And that's for a case with a small number of goods. When we have more goods, we have to use geometric methods. But once they believe me that it can work, then we can move to more goods, and we have moved to more goods. Uh, and so, well, I won't talk now about how it works with more goods. Um, there are lots of open questions, of course. I'd love you guys to, lots of Parisian geometers here, I hope, so you can help me uh, develop it. Um, in particular, perhaps you would be concerned with uh, small numbers, so we need to do research on oligopoly. Uh, so I'm interested in that. Um, but I'm also interested in things like um, Olivier's work. I mean, Olivier is interested in uh, equilibrium, but restricting to plausible strategies, which I think is really important. But, you know, to think about how people actually think about these problems in the real world uh, and restrict, perhaps, to the relevant strategy set for them. So, um, <clears throat> I think looking at what happens when people aren't simply doing competitive equilibrium is important. So, to conclude, I hope I persuade you that Parisian geometry is interesting and it is fun. Uh, our geometric methods help understand preferences. They also uh, give us these beautiful new theorems, including new theorems about when competitive equilibrium exists. And importantly, it's also useful. It's actually being, you know, helping us develop auctions now. So m my motto is this. 
And I am delighted that your motto turns out to be that. Uh, and I know it's well deserved. And, um, well, happy 10th birthday. Thank you very much.